Hi everyone, my name is Katie Robertson and I'm the founder and director for The Anchor Gathering and I want to officially welcome you to The Anchor at Home. We are so glad you're tuning in. If you're in a watch party or you're on your own, we are so thankful you're joining us tonight. We have a great evening planned and before we get started, I always like to share a few things. We'd love to get your help getting the word out and sharing this good news of Jesus Christ. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Anchor Gathering, and follow us, like us, and share us on our social media platforms. That would be so great. And most important, consider becoming a watch party host. Come on board to open your home and invite women in to watch our Anchor at Home program together to be encouraged in the hope Jesus brings. So if you're interested, we'd love for you to go to our website, theanchorgathering.com, and we will connect with you. Well, before we start with our program, we've got some very fun news to share. And to do that, we are gonna hear from our dear friends of the Anchor, Paula and Rita, and they are gonna be joining us from the East Coast. They've got some very exciting news to share, so let's take you there now. Out for. What are you we got, out for? we got a big trip coming. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we're going to the West Coast. <laughs> like, last, like last summer. Like last summer. It was incredible. Listen, like, listen, we got the Anchor Day Retreat. That's what we're getting ready for. The Anchor Day Retreat, Wednesday, August 21st, okay? We're training together. Yeah, we are. And, and physical training, it says in the Bible, is of some use, but you know what is even better? Spiritual training. Spiritual training. That is right, Rita. We're going to turn some heads. Maybe there's some old men in Gikamba. I don't even know. Yeah, so where are we going to meet up with there? Um, we're going to go to Chapel Hill Church. There's a gathering place for the anchor gathering. Doesn't that sound That strange? helps me remember. And then do you know what we're doing afterwards? This is why we're working out. So we can go clubbing. Where are we going to club? There's a club. Club is down by the water. Let's do it. And what we're gonna do a happy hour. Ooh, I'm always happy. I and I can be happy for one full hour. So we're gonna be in good shape for that retreat. It's gonna be so good. <laughs> it's gonna be so good. <laughs> Thank you, Paula and Rita, for that great news. Once again, mark your calendars. August 21st will be our Anchor Day getaway in Gig Harbor, Washington. And now we like to start with music, and it's an honor to get to introduce to you our special guest tonight. Her name is Natalie Grant, and Natalie is a top contemporary Christian singer-songwriter. She has received nine Grammy nominees, she has won five Dove Awards. She has over 500 million streams sharing the hope of Jesus through her lyrics to the world. So great to hear. And she and her husband live in Nashville, Tennessee. So let's hear now from Natalie Grant. I'm Natalie Grant. This is my husband, Bernie Herms. Hey there. <laughs> We're coming to you from our home in Nashville, Tennessee. Not sure where this is finding you, but you know, as I think about that word anchor, and it's a privilege to be able to share with all of you who are part of this anchor um, Bible study group. And um, you know, as I think of that word, I can't think of a time in my lifetime <laughs> where I've needed to be anchored. Uh, needed that lifeline more than ever before in this season. I'm, you know, in a, in a season where everything seems upside down. Um, everything seems uncertain. We don't know what to believe. So opinionated. What's true, what isn't. I am so grateful for that which is permanent. Permanently true. And that is the word of God. The message of the gospel. And, um, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm leaning into that message more than ever before because it is truly the only place that we can find um, 
Full security, full safety, even if we don't feel it, it doesn't change that it's true. So I have to keep reminding myself to anchor myself to the permanent word of God because my feelings, I cannot be anchored to my feelings. My feelings don't just change every day. They might change every hour. Um, so I'm grateful that Father God is not dependent on my emotions or my feelings, that he, who, he is who he is regardless of how I feel in the moment. Uh, I wrote this song in a moment where I felt exhausted. I, I felt like I didn't even know what to pray, but I knew that I needed to step closer to the Father. And I pray that's what you're doing in this season, that there's nothing he needs to do to come closer to you. The word of God tells us that he is near to those who are brokenhearted. He's near to the crushed in spirit. He's near to us, but sometimes we're the ones that need to take a step closer to him, to take a hold of that hand that he's extending, his hand of grace, of mercy, of love, um, of truth. And so I pray that this song helps to bring you closer to who he is, staying hand in hand until the day that we get to stand face to face.
<laughs> wow, what a gift. That was a beautiful song. We could never thank you enough, Natalie and Bernie. That was incredible. Well, at this time, we get to hear our anchor moment, and that is a time we get to hear from a guest a little bit about their life, their faith journey, and an anchor moment that they've had. And an anchor moment is a time that their faith has been grounded, they've seen Jesus to be real, Jesus has really been their anchor. Lately, I've been saying, an encounter with the Lord. So tonight, we are so thankful to have with us Sarah Graham, and we're gonna take you now to a special interview. Well, we're so thankful to be here together. I get to introduce the guest for the Anchor Moment, and tonight, very special guest, my identical twin sister, Sarah Graham, and she is my best friend. And we thought, before we get going on um, the Anchor Moment, we thought it would be fun to share some twin moments. So as you can see, um, today we did decide to look a little alike. We both put a baseball, baseball hat on for you, so we hope you can tell us apart. Um, let's start with our twin moments. Why don't you go first, Sarah? Moments. I just would say hello to everyone, and I'm so thankful that my sister agreed to put a hat on because I always wear a hat, and so um, thank you that we're both in our hats and we look more alike this way. Anyway, uh, twin moments. We were born on May 6th, 1963, in Seattle, and I am, I, we should ask you guys to guess who's the older twin. <laughs> I'm the older twin by five minutes. And that's right, she is my big sis, and the boss, usually. <laughs> so, we have, the next moment's a really, really special one. And it is actually an anchor moment. It is actually, I think you would agree, right, Sarah? That it is our first anchor moment in our faith. And um, when I came up with the anchor moment, when the anchor started 12 years ago, this was the first moment that came to my mind when I thought, when has Jesus been my anchor? So we're gonna share this one so brief, but we were both four years old, four or five years old. We shared a room and just picture us in our twin beds, obviously. And it is our nighttime routine. And I gotta back up for one second. Our mom, thank you Lord for our mom. She shared with us about prayer and she shared with us about who Jesus is and we, really took that serious when we were little girls, didn't we? Because every single night we had a little routine with a prayer because we tended to be, would you say, worrisome children? We were anxious. We had a lot of anxieties. We were worried. Yes. So I think this is kind of a funny little story, but we think that, oh, honestly, for me, and I know we've talked, it is an anchor <laughs> moment in our faith. And so every, every night I would ask my sister, if she would ask the Lord to ask if he, if I was going to die. Now, yes, I did have a phobia of dying. Every night I was very afraid. So, well, first of all, we always said our prayers together. And then after our ma our parents weren't in the room, we were just alone in our beds. Aren't we had single beds? And she would ask me that. And I would be quiet and ask him my my mind, my heart, and I would seriously hear, no, you're not going to die. And I would share with her, no, you're not going to die. That was such then, a relief. Then I would ask her, we're getting very personal here, I want you all to know, I would ask her, I had such a fear of the dentist as a little girl, and I had such a fear of getting a cavity. It sounds ridiculous. <laughs> but I would ask my sister, am I going to get a cavity? Well, let me take it from here. So then I would seriously, very quietly, and I mean, I would ask the Lord, just like she said, in my little head and heart, and I would, I'd say, does Sarah have a cavity? And I would hear that faint little voice that would say, nope, she doesn't. And I would assure you, nope, no cavity. And, and the good news is I've never had a cavity. Ever. ever. And we and stood I, on that but like I, you don't know. But it's, a, it's childlike faith. I prayed and prayed so hard as that little girl. Um, anyway, I had to share that because it's very important. And then Katie. I haven't died yet. <laughs> and it is honestly the best news I ever heard when, about Jesus. And that's the actually the message of the anchor that I get to live forever in heaven knowing Jesus Christ. So we share that one because it truly anchored our faith. And we hope that inspires you, encourages you as a mom or a grandma, aunt, whoever. But we're never too little and we're never too old to really, you know, share our little anxieties and 
every care with the Lord. So moving on to the second. This kind of, um, yeah, our next moment together, we were uh, growing up, we went to church and Sunday school and we were in a youth group. And when we were 12, we both clearly remember being at a, a concert. We both accepted Jesus. Um, and, and became Christians. So that was so exciting. We both went home with a new Bible and a new workbook on becoming and a Christian. And that was 12 years old, our second twin moment, really anchor moment. And now the third one I have is, oh, always good in April. We had a April Fool's fun. We switched classes two times in sixth grade and senior year, and we tricked everybody except for one person. And that is another story. So next one, Hold on twin moment. moment. Next twin moment in college it was actually. We tried out for the double mint gum commercial. A double pleasure is waiting for you. A double pleasure from double mint gum. A double great feeling making you realize. This is nerve wracking for me, but having to go in front of a camera, we had to make up, we had like 30 minutes to make up a dance and a sl the slogan to perform. So that was scary. And no, we didn't make it, but it was fun. You haven't seen us on a commercial. <laughs> oh. um, the next one, oh, this is a good one. We switched dates. Well, my sister's boyfriend came up to me in high school and put his arm around me. And that's when I just couldn't embarrass him and tell him you're on the wrong. I'm not the one. So I just went right along with it. You know, what do you do? I just held his hand and walked down the hall and pretended I was Sarah. It worked great. He never knew. He Next knew. one. Next one. Oh. We both went to the University of Washington and graduated the same year. Our lives kind of went different paths. We'd been doing everything together and kind of following each other and whatever we did. And when we went to the UW, I joined uh, the sport teams. Um, I was, I ran, I rode crew and then I ran track and cross country and Katie ended up becoming a young life leader and doing young life and working at um, the local church there, University Presbyterian Church. So we kind of, we started on the crew team together and then I went off to be a young life leader and she went on to continue the sporty realm. Next one, we both were married the same year, twin moment. And you're next. We had our first children three months apart. She had Karina first, and then three months later, I had my first son, Sam, so. And then the next good. big moment was, you were gonna share oh, it. The next really big moment is our second children. We called our mom the same day, without even telling each other that we had just taken the little pregnancy test and knew we were pregnant. We called her the same day to tell her that we were having um, a baby the same day. So it was one of those really crazy twin and our moments. Children were only a week, our due dates were a week apart. The due dates were a week apart. Very twin moment. And what else do we have on here? Oh, I love this one. We only have a couple more. <laughs> we ran the Boston Marathon together in our matching outfits, and it was a highlight of. I'm going to say our lives. She pulled me over the finish. She almost ditched me at the end. We had a great time. We wanted to make the cutoff for the next year so we could do it again. And we did. <laughs> but never again. That's We're ending it on that marathon note. That was a really good one. Then you've one more worth so sharing. So now our, uh, we live in the same town. We have never lived in the same town except when we were growing up. And finally, after 30 years, I moved to Gig Harbor. And the other special note is we're going to show, I bought, we bought the same hat. We didn't know it, but um, this has caused some issues because in Gig Harbor wearing this hat, there were a number of people that thought it was Katie. So I quit wearing the hat. <laughs> and everybody, just so you know, that was really a little hard for me. Coming in on my town with the same hat. I was but getting. I didn't mean to buy the same hat. I, I like the hat. Buy the same things. <laughs> but now I don't wear that hat anymore. Um, I think that's enough twin moments, and now we want to get on to the anchor moment. So, we are going to ask you a few questions, and we want to hear now a little bit about yourself. Tell us a little bit. Here she wants to know a little about myself. She knows everything about me, but I will tell we all of you. all to know <laughs> a bit about myself. I have two older sisters. We have two older sisters and an older brother. And so we were quite a bit younger than the rest of the family, but we always had each other to play with. So that was really, really special for the two of us. We went to Nathan Hale High School, and then after high school, we went off to the University of Washington. I have a kinesiology degree. I've worked in fitness. It, over the past 30 years, I teach fitness classes, um, work at health clubs. I have three grown children, two boys and a girl. My sons live in New York. My daughter lives in Bozeman, Montana. So I'm really thankful that I'm here in Gig Harbor with Katie because my kids don't live near me. Um, I miss them. 
And let's see, what else? I'm very competitive. I've done a lot of, uh, of um, training for Ironmans and bike racing, and I'm an adventure seeker and hiker, and, and that's what I love to do is exercise and fitness. Um, a good word to describe me would be sporty because I love sports and I always have, and that's kind of where we're a little different. It's, she would have been the ballerina and I would have been the professional basketball player. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about your faith journey. Well, we already talked a lot about it in that uh, we became, or I became a Christian when I was 12 that I really firmly remember. And what's anchored me since then is I've been involved with Bible Study Fellowship, BSF, and I have been in that program for over 25 years. It has kept me grounded. It's as good as me going to the gym to work out fitness-wise. I go to BSF for my spiritual workout, and I love the Bible, and it's really grounded me. So BSF, that has kept me really strong in my faith and learning, learning by the day. Share with us an anchor moment. I've already told you I was, I'm a really competitive athlete. <laughs> and so in all of my training and my fitness in the late 90s, 1990s, um, I was signed up to do an Ironman triathlon. And for my training, I thought it would be a good thing to sign up for Ramrod. Now, if you haven't heard of that, it goes every year, It's it stands for ride around Mount Rainier in one day. Yes, it's a long day. It takes all day. <laughs> it's 150 miles with 10,000 feet of climbing. We start at five in the morning, Enumclaw High School, and we ride around the mountain. We go up through the park, up to Paradise, down and around through Crystal Mountain and back into Enumclaw. So it takes 10 to 12 hours to do it. Um, I signed up that first year and finished it and I finished my Ironman, everything was great. Um, you'll get the point of this in a minute. <laughs> so I signed up to do it again the next year. Well, the second time I did it, it was horrible, freezing, torrential rain, snow, and hypothermia. I mean, a lot of the riders had to pull out. I don't even know how I finished. I just remember eating chocolate chip cookies the whole way on all these different stops you go to. And I, I finished the event Again, to, I think it took me 12 hours. It was awful. It was horrible. I vowed never to do it again, ever. So fast forward. Um, I didn't think I was ever going to do it again. Well, five years later, I decided to do it again. Some other people that I knew were doing it, and I thought, oh, I'm just going to do it again. <laughs> so I enter. And this is a ride where they only let 800 riders do it. It's a lottery, and I, I've gotten in every time. Anyway, I won't go into the bore you with those details. Got into the ride. Um, and I have to say, this is where my anchor moment happened on that day. It's always held the third Thursday of July. So this day, it was beautiful sun, hot, and we started early, um, rode up to the park. You come into the Nisqually entrance. If you've, I'm sure you've been to Mount Rainier. It's, it's, it's so special. You go into the park, you ride. It's 12 miles up to Paradise. And this year in particular, I don't know if the wildflowers were better or what got me, but there was all these flowers along the sides of the road, kind of leading up to paradise and my heart's pounding and, and it was just this excitement to get to the top. It's all switchbacks. You're going around each one, each curve, hoping that the next one you're gonna see the mountain. Finally got there and it was spectacular. The mountain was out, full glory, blue sky, white. Yeah, I mean, just beautiful. Take that moment and just breathe it all in. And it was at that moment, I was like, Lord, this is amazing. I love you. Or it was like just praising him for creation. And why hadn't, why hadn't I seen this before? How beautiful it really was. So, you know, I ate my little snack and then we descend off the back side of the mountain there. And if anyone, if you ride a bike, this is a biker's dream is the descent off Mount Rainier, off Paradise. You go through Box Canyon, Stevens Canyon, and it's these swooping, sweeping turns. I'm going 40 miles an hour. But the whole way down, you, you start off the mountain, you go by reflection lakes, the mountain is reflecting, the wildflowers are on either side. That one, this one day, this one ride um, was just something so special for me. I started singing, I don't even know why the song came to my head from Godspell, it's called Day by Day. Oh dear Lord, three things I pray, to see thee more clearly, love you more dearly, follow you more nearly. Well, I've got that going in my head and I'm just singing out loud and swooping down the hill, you know, swooping down the slope and seeing the mountain. I can only just tell all of you that it was one of those, I met God outside and just praised him. 
And when I finally finished that whole ride, I was like, that was amazing. I'm going to do it every year. And so since then, I've done it now 22 times. I've done it every year and I call it my divine appointment. I can hardly wait every end of July to climb that mountain and come swooping down, praising the Lord, whatever's happened that year, whatever I'm, I'm thinking about. Anyway, it's just, I always sing day by day and I always um, just praise the Lord as I'm going down that mountain. You know, you don't always see the Lord um, at work and the year that I did it, when it was hypothermic, the mountain was not out. You could not see it. Um, but the following years, you guys, it was sunny and hot every single time I've done it. 20 times in a row that I've done it, sunny and hot. Never cloudy again. How weird is that? I mean, but I just I kind of made a point on, you don't know, the mountain's always there. You don't always see it. It can be cloudy. Um, but when it shines, when it's out, you, you can just be thankful that God is always with you. I just um, hope and pray for all of you watching this that you'll get to meet God outside and just really enjoy um, creation. And hopefully this little moment can, you'll, you'll look at Mount Rainier and think of it differently now. <laughs> we are so thankful you've been with us today. Well, thank you. Hi everyone, I want to welcome you to the historic Boys in the Boat crew house here in Seattle, Washington at the University of Washington campus. Recently, as most of you know, the Boys in the Boat movie came out based on the story and I was very inspired by it to share a message. So we thought it would be fun to come and be here on location with you and this is a very special time because this is one of the very last times that we will be able to see what the crew house looks like in its historic state. It is soon to go under a huge renovation to become a beautiful venue. So we are so glad we're here. Let's go on in now and take a look. Well, here we are, we're in the, the crew house now and I want to show you one of the boats. Now this is called a shell and I want to point out a few things. First of all, Rowers is on these seats, they're on wheels, you get to use your whole body, your feet go in here, but this is where I want to show you, is the back of the boat, it's called the stern, and this is where I think the most important position of the, the coxswain sits here, and the coxswain, their job is to navigate, steer, keep the rhythm of the rowers, and really, in a nutshell, they're the coach in the boat. They call the shots and the commands they use. Well, back in the day, a, an old little megaphone. To steer, they would use, as you remember, this is one of the old wooden ones. They use these little knockers. It turns the rudder and they can help with the cadence to encourage the rowers to keep the pace, helping to pull through to the finish. Pretty fun that we get to be here to see some of this firsthand equipment for rowing crew. It's a privilege to get to share the message with you tonight. I always like to share around this time of year. It's really the time the anchor began. It was 12 years ago, shortly after the biggest storm hit my life, when our daughter Karina passed away after a five-year battle with cancer. And it was during that time that our faith in Jesus Christ held us so strong during the journey and now the aftermath that I developed a passion to share with everyone how real Jesus is and I have just seen him in so many ways and I'm excited to share tonight with you. I've come up with an analogy that has to do with this rowing and crew theme. So very fun that we get to be in this venue. Now the Boys in the Boat book, the very first time I ever heard of it was when it came out in book form and our family was taking a drive by car to Banff, Canada and that's a 12-hour car ride from Gig Harbor and it was on the way home that we were diverted onto another route and due to a snowstorm and it was the craziest thing. I decided I'm going to read this book out loud and as we drove along it was like as if on cue. I would read a landmark from the main character Joe Ranza's life and we would drive by it. It was one of those moments our whole family was in awe like how can this be happening to us on this road when we're reading this book. That was the first way it kind of resonated with me. But most of all, 
the whole crew and rowing theme resonates with me because I actually rowed here at the University of Washington in the early 1980s, my freshman and sophomore year. And it was a wonderful experience. I just loved the sport and being on the water. And one of my biggest memories from rowing crew is the command of the coxswain. And here's what that coxswain would say, power 10 in two. And you might be wondering, what does that mean? Well, a power 10 is an intense burst of energy. You pull as hard as you can for 10 strokes. And the two is, it's in two strokes. You're gonna pull for 10. And I, they use, they can do a power 20, a power five. You listen to the coxswain, he calls the command. Well, I started thinking for this little message today, I have come up with the power four for powerful promises of Jesus Christ that will pull us through this life to victory. So I'm gonna share those with you and I'm really excited. Well, the first power promise is the promise of the Lord's presence and voice. This is the greatest promise to be anchored on is that the Lord is always with us, will never leave us. And that is when we ask him to come into our lives, into our boat, I should say. Um, good for the analogy here. But I've been thinking about this, that the Lord Jesus is truly the ultimate coxswain. I got to share with you a little about, about what a coxswain does. And the coxswain is that one, as Jesus, the ultimate one, able to navigate our lives. He's got the plan. He knows us. He's made us. He can give us the wisdom, guidance, everything we need. And we have a privilege that we get to hear his voice. As a coxswain, you know, yells out those commands, we get to hear that still, small, audible voice of the Lord. And we get the best ever is to hear his voice come loud and clear through the Bible. And I got to hold this book up because this, like I was sharing before, like a megaphone, this is what the Lord has to share with us. His words are in here and they speak so uniquely to each one of us, the wisdom, love, guidance, um, and everything that we need to pull through this life. As I've been studying this, a cool detail about Jesus, there are lots of stories about him in boats in the Bible. And I got to thinking, they're probably kind of primitive boats, wooden with oars. And in Mark four, the detail really popped off the page. If you want to check it out, Mark 4, verse 38, it says where Jesus was sitting. He was sitting in the stern. It says the stern, and that is where the ultimate coxswain sits, in the stern, in the back of the boat, because they can see. He can see where you're going. A rower, we cannot see. As you're rowing the boat, you do not see the, the path you're on. You have to completely trust the coxswain and trust him that he's going to take you where he knows is best. And that is our job with the Lord, is trusting him and listening to his voice. He knows the best way. And it says in Psalm 32, verse 8, one of my favorite verses, it says this, the Lord says, quote, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. I love that image. He's got his eye on us as that coxswain. He sees us. He sees where we're going. He calls the shots. He knows the best way. He can straighten things out. He's going to get us victoriously through to the finish. And we can really trust him. Well, the second promise is the promise of the pull. Now, you're probably going, Katie, what do you mean by the pull? Well, this is where, as a rower, the oar, it's all about the pulling, okay? The work of the rower is to pull hard. I don't know if you can see this big oar, but this is what I learned when you join crew, this is a whole new thing. You've got to learn how to place this oar in the water. There's techniques, there is intense strength training, two a day workouts. It is the hardest I've ever worked, but you get strong so you can pull hard. And your work is to do your very best and pull the hardest on your oar. You use your whole body. So I started thinking, I'm gonna set this down. I started thinking about what is the work that we have to do in our faith? And that is, it's in the book of John. I love the book of John. Chapter six, the disciples come to Jesus and they specifically ask him, Lord, what are the works that you want us to do? 
And this is where I had a little aha. They say works. And here is what the Lord says. He goes, hey guys, the work, not works, the work God requires of you is to believe in the one he sent, Jesus Christ. I thought, he's like, you're looking at him. But he is saying just one thing. It's a verb to believe. One work. Our work is to pull hard on believing. And that is what I have found to be the key for living strong and rising above our circumstances and having the strength to go through this life and pull through to the finish. And I have seen this so true. It's those anchor truths, I call them. But when you really believe, and believe means, by definition, to wholeheartedly rely on, depend on, trust in someone. And when you think of that, you know, pulling hard, it's like believing with all your might. That's the kind of belief I'm talking about. And I haven't ever shared this little story. This is a very special um, little devotional that I have. And back um, right in the beginning of the, the big storm of my life, when our daughter Karina got sick, it was June 21st, 2005. And three days in, June 24th, I decided I would start reading my devotional again. I was pretty in shock in the beginning. I didn't want to read anything, but I am a devotional Bible reader. It's helped my whole life. And I got my little devotional and I'm like, okay, I'm going to read it. And I opened it up and it opened to June 23rd as if, Katie, you forgot to read the 23rd. And I have tried many times to open this little devotional to June 23rd, but it, it just doesn't. It did that day on the 24th. And this is what it said. It said, this sickness will not be unto death, but it will be to bring glory to my father in heaven. Now that verse, I pulled on that so hard with all my belief that Karina wouldn't die. And everybody, she lived with us for five years and I've got other stories to tell crazy times. She lived with us, and I know that she lives forever. That is the promise we have. He, she is in heaven with Jesus Christ. And there is a purpose. There is a purpose behind and in the journeys that we have. And I trusted and believed with all my heart. And it, this verse has carried me through to this very day. It has helped me rise above and helped me to be filled with hope. And let me tell you, in the beginning, I thought, we're going to drown. That was the first thing I thought when our daughter got diagnosed with cancer. I'm like, we are going down. And this verse, believing in Jesus Christ, he has kept me up, given me joy. I was able to live my life with our daughter and with joy and strength for the journey. But it was believing, believing on the Lord and his promise that he's got a bigger purpose. And it says in Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. I love that verse. When you believe on Jesus and his truths, he will save you. He saved me from drowning, from thinking, I can't do this. I can't get out of bed. He is real and I have seen him at work. He keeps us strong. So that is our number two. Well, sometimes, let's be honest, Life gets hard, challenging, and we start to doubt a little bit. We have disbelief, and I've been there. I know in the Bible, lots of times the disciples deal with disbelief, and we're kind of crying out, Lord, help us with our, our unbelief. We need each other. We cannot go this life alone, and that is one of the biggest reasons I started the anchor. I... I just knew we needed each other. I could never think of going through life um, on my own, especially when you're going through these really hard times. And the boys in the boat, this is part of that movie I just loved, was the camaraderie of the boys in the boat. They had the friendship and the encouragement for one another that pulled them through. It made them really a stronger winning team because of their friendships with one another. So that is my third promise, is the promise of people. And that is huge, that God loves on us. 
through people. He brings people into our lives to help us in our, on our journeys. And I have found this to be so true. And the biggest time ever was that first um, season of our daughter and her journey with cancer. We were going smooth sailing. The treatments were going well. I'm like, we got this. And all of a sudden, Karina, 14 years old, she gets a terrible infection and we end up in the ICU and the doctors talk to my husband and I and say, how do you want to see your daughter die? I'm like, what? This cannot be happening. And I was in shock. I went back into the room where Karina was in the ICU. Karina was coherent and she remembers what I did. We still would talk about it. I, in all my belief, wholeheartedly, I cried out to the Lord, Lord, show us you're here. And you would not believe what happened. Right when I said that, like on cue, these four heads popped up in the ICU windows of the double doors. And it was these four guys that they didn't know we'd just gotten this news, but something had nudged them to come to the hospital to pray for the Robertsons. And I cannot begin to tell you what that did for us. And, and at the same time, our favorite traveling nurse, his name was Adam, he came in in his street clothes. The timing was crazy. He just wanted to check on us. And he looked at the report. He said, Katie, I've seen this before. You're going to be good. She's going to make it. And it was the next day, I'm telling you, the doctors came in. It was a, they called it a miracle. They could not believe it, that Karina had pulled through. And the doctor told my husband, well, and me too, but he said, hey, you guys can go to your son's football game. That was code for coast is clear, she's made it, and I cannot even begin to tell you how those people coming in at that moment helped give us the strength we needed. And then the, the last time when Karina was sick in the ICU, I have to share this one because it is so dear to my heart. And it was right there at the, kind of in the end of our daughter's life, I would see this tall, stoic man outside the, in the hallway of the ICU. He had glasses. His name is Rick Enlow. Some of you might know him. I didn't really know him that well. I hadn't ever really talked to him. He was our pastor at our church and he would leave a little business card. Every time he, he was there, I just would see that his presence had been there. It spoke so loud and clear to me. I just felt a calm and peace. And then it was shortly after that, the story got a little crazier. After Karina did pass away, he ended up coming to our door and the kids, Annika and Eric, answered the door and he asked them for my husband's dress shoes that he'd be wearing to the memorial. And I didn't know this was going on. The kids ran to my husband's closet, got his shoes, Rick took them, and shortly after came back with the shiniest, greatest, tallest shoes you've ever seen. And I cannot begin to tell you once again, that meant the world to us. And then to top it off, Rick and his wife Marv, our dear friends, they were positioned on our street, Powell Road, two doors down, right after our daughter passed away. There is nothing like having a pastor on your road during the hardest time of your life. So that's just another one of those, God using his people. And I have to share my favorite anchor story of all time is it's the dark and stormy night. We used to meet at Cutter's Point in person before COVID. And every time I placed this sandwich board out in front of the door, and on the one particular time, I thought, this is such a pain in the neck. What Does anyone even look at these signs? And that very night, a woman had driven in. She called it the dark and stormy night. She'd been diagnosed with breast cancer. She saw the sign. She came on in, was welcomed, ushered to a table. And what are the chances? She sat with three women who'd all had breast cancer. And they all walked her through the journey. That one blew me away how the Lord works through loving on us through people, and He nudges us to love on people. So I, I want your ear to be attuned if there's someone on your heart that you can be that person to. Well, the fourth promise is the promise of victory. We have victory to live strong each day, and we have victory over death. We have the promise of living forever in heaven with Jesus Christ. But I was so inspired by the Boys in the Boat movie at the 
finish of their, well, at the ending of the movie, when they make it to the Olympics, they're in Berlin, it's 1936. They have so many obstacles against them. You just go, there is no way they can win. They've got their stroke or has been sick for like three days with almost a pneumonia. A stroke or is your, you know, besides the coxswain, the, the, co the stroke or is what sets the cadence. He's got to be strong and really ready for action. And so he had been sick. Then they got the worst lane assignment, lane one. And that is terrible. And then that's where all the headwinds came in is on that lane. So three big obstacles, the headwinds and all. And you just think there is no way. But you know if you've watched the movie and it is glorious, then it made me start thinking of our life in knowing Jesus Christ. More than we could ask or imagine, those guys kind of make it through the finish and they are victorious. They win the gold medal. There are so many obstacles we face and so many headwinds. I'm thinking, I bet right now some of you might be facing a headwind or a challenge that is, you're thinking, how am I ever going to get through this? And I've been there and I'm just here to share that the strength that Jesus Christ brings and the truth he is. And I was thinking of my life thinking, how have I pulled through? I have had so many obstacles and I am just here standing to share with you that Jesus is real and he does pull us through this life. Our daughter got sick, that was big enough for me. That was a major obstacle. Then when she passed away, but then I don't talk much about after that, the aftermath, just in a little, uh, this will tell you a lot, 85 to 90% of marriages don't make it after you lose a child. I think that's all I need to say. It's a very challenging time with grief. And there were so many times the headwinds felt so strong. I'm like, Lord, how can I make it? How can I get through this life and live strong? And I cannot believe the Lord has met me and been more than enough over and over. And I'm gonna just finish with the one culminating story that I think sums it up. And it's still for me to reminisce on it gives me hope and just as re a reminder that God is so good and does more than we can ask or imagine when we put our trust and belief in him. It was an anniversary of, of our daughter's death. My husband received a song on his Facebook. A friend had reached out, totally out of the blue, this is one of those people <laughs> nudges that I'm like so thankful this guy did it. He put the song Glorious Unfolding by Stephen Curtis Chapman, shared it on my husband's Facebook. My husband, I'll never forget, he teared up listening to it and he said, Kate, you gotta listen to this song. So I listened to it and I, I agreed. Stephen Curtis Chapman is our family favorite, top contemporary Christian musician that we have followed all through life. Our kids, if you only knew how many dance parties we've had in the car to his music. He is our very favorite. Crean and I always wished we could meet him. But the story goes, this song so touched my husband. And he said, Katie, I'm gonna meet Stephen Curtis Chapman. And I'm kind of thinking, yeah, right, but let's give it a chance. Maybe you should text Brandon Heath Another musician that we've met over the years, another story that's kind of crazy, said maybe he could help you. Well, that's what my husband did, texted Brandon Heath, and this is what was crazy what happened. Right away, like on the second, the text came back from Brandon. It said, dude, done. I'm having coffee with Stephen Curtis right now. At the moment, my husband had texted him, and from then on out, the story truly was one of those where more than you could ask or imagine. They had come into town here in Seattle and Brandon set it up. We got to meet Stephen Curtis Chapman. And for those of you who don't know, he also has lost a child to a, a tragic accident. And so I cannot even tell you how special of a, a time it was. We talked to him for hours and then it even got more glorious. We, and My husband and I invited them to come be with us at a couples weekend at the Young Life Camp Malibu. And they said, yes. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we're gonna meet Stephen Curtis and Mary Beth. And they came and stayed with us. They came to Malibu and I'll never forget Stephen Curtis Chapman standing in the dining hall at the Malibu camp. And he sang glorious unfolding to all of the people there in the dining hall and then topped it off with a special birthday song written just for my husband. 
Born in Tacoma. <laughs> Same year as Madonna. <laughs> I teared up. I could not believe. I knew that God was loving on me. I knew he was on my husband. But that was a turning point, turning point in my life, in our family's life, that the Lord saw us and he helped pull us through with the goodness and that kind of a story, bringing the people into our lives. It, I just could not say enough. So in conclusion... I just, I love that story. It always brings me hope to know that I'm no one extra special. The Lord God Almighty loves each one of you. And he's dying, dying to do amazing things in your life, more than you can ask or imagine. So just summing it up, I hope you can hold on to the power four. You are going to pull through this life really strong, knowing that you've got the presence of of the Lord and his voice. You can hear him. You've got the Bible to go to. Promise of the pull, the believing, the promise of the believing with all your heart and the people, the promise of people. The Lord is going to continue. Bring people into your life to love on you and use you in others' lives. And we have that final four here, the promise of victory. We can live strong together here and forever. Well, I just want to end with these couple verses. They truly sum it up. And the one is from John 16, 33. The Lord says, my peace I leave with you. In this world, you're going to have trouble, which I thought of headwinds and obstacles. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Overcome means victory. With Jesus Christ, you have victory and hope. You will be able to get through. You are the winner for sure. And then other verse that is so awesome, 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Thanks be to God, exclamation point. I love exclamation points. He gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the best news ever. So thanks a lot, and I hope you're encouraged. Well, I want to share something really cool that happened right at the, after I ended my message and we were packing up to go, my, the videographer and I were going out the door and we ran into these two women and you're not going to believe who one of them was. One of them was Joe Rance's daughter. So Joe Rance is that main character in The Boys in the Boat. His daughter, Judy, just happened to be coming to the boathouse to do a presentation that very early morning. Actually, it's like... Okay, where did you dream all this up? Because that couldn't possibly have happened the way it did. But there it was, and all of a sudden, you know. That's your dad? We've got the book, yeah. That is yeah. so incredible and so inspiring. It story. is inspiring. We just were confirmed God loving on us in the details through people. It was really special, and she shared a moment with us. You will find some discussion questions on the screen that you can go deeper with your watch party or on your own, and we hope and pray that you'll go deeper with the message. Well, in conclusion, we just want to say thank you again for joining us. We are so glad you've been able to be with us tonight. And before we really end the program, I wanted to share how we are dreaming big. Our vision is to see women everywhere discover Jesus Christ as the anchor for their lives. And we would love to have you come on board and prayerfully consider giving a gift to the Anchor Gathering to help us to reach more women. There are a few ways you could do this. You can find the QR code on the screen. You can ask your watch party host, she's got it in the watch party kit, or go to our website to our giving page, theanchorgathering.com. Together, we can make a huge difference. We wanna thank you so much for any support. Well, now to end, we wanna wish you a wonderful month filled with abundant joy and blessings. And until next time, like I always like to say, stay anchored and we'll see you soon. Lay your head down tonight, take a rest from the fight. And don't try to figure it out. Just listen to what I'm whispering to your heart. Cause I know this is not anything like you thought the story of your life was gonna be.
And it feels like the end has started closing in on you But it's just not true There's so much of the story that's still yet to unfold And this is going to be a glory For this world and your heart Has been to show His glory and His grace Forever revealing the depth and the beauty of His unfailing love And the story has only begun And this is going to be a 